Because remember, we have fluctuating levels of progesterone. Progesterone tends to be lower in the first half of the cycle and then climb higher in the second half of the cycle. So if a woman has insomnia or any other progesterone, low progesterone symptoms in the, fir in, in the entire cycle, we're gonna dose the entire cycle, but the second half of the cycle is gonna be higher. All right, this is what you can do for women. You can do transdermal, you can do oral, micronized. Don't do injection. Apparently there's reports of causing tissue necrosis with progesterone injections of bioidentical, not the Lupron injections that they give for uh, oral contraceptives. But these, the main one I'm doing is oral. The reason why is because allopregnanolone, which is that neurosteroid that's made from the conversion, that also happens in the liver. So when you take oral progesterone, some of that gets converted to allopregnanolone, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and helps with the sleepiness effect and the pain reduction. Yes, you will have some patients report some sleepiness with transdermal, but that is very rare. The sleepiness comes from the oral. So I use oral majority of the time. If finances are an option and patient has no issues with sleep, then I'll put it in the transdermal because typically when you have a bias cream and then you add in progesterone, it doesn't double the price of the cream per month. It maybe adds on like four or five dollars per month. So consider it. Um, so this is where there's a lot of variation on how you can dose progesterone based on how the woman feels during her cycle, okay? Because remember, we have fluctuating levels of progesterone. Progesterone tends to be lower in the first half of the cycle and then climb higher in the second half of the cycle. So if a woman has insomnia or any other progesterone, low progesterone symptoms in the, fir in, in the entire cycle, we're gonna dose the entire cycle, but the second half of the cycle is gonna be higher. So we'll do 100 and 200, for example, or 100 and 300, or 200 and 300. Depends on the patient, but typically I'm starting at 100 and 200 for that case. If their follicular phase is great and they have no symptoms, and it's the luteal phase that they have issues with, which is more common to have that be the issue, that their baseline progesterone is fine, but they're not getting the increase in progesterone they want for the luteal phase, then we're doing, starting with like 100 milligrams, days 15 until they start bleeding. Or a little bit better than that, and I should have had this, but if they're regular on their bleeding on day 28, you stop that few days before to help that natural fall in progesterone, okay? But if it's all over the place for the cycle, which some women have that, 27, 32, 30, and it's all over the place, then you can just have them go until the first day that they start bleeding or they know they're gonna bleed the next day. As long as women are in tune with their bodies, they should be good with that. You can go up on progesterone. The highest I think I've had to go orally is about 300 milligrams during that second half of the phase. It's rare that I have to go higher than that. Um, that usually seems to, do, seems to do well, okay? When you start working with the oral stuff, you can also start mixing stuff at the compounding pharmacy. Right? You can add in DHEA and pregnenolone, which yes, they can get as a supplement. Yes, you can make money off that as a supplement, but it costs the patient more. Right? They spend 40 bucks a month on the progesterone capsule from the compounding pharmacy, and then they spend $10 a month on the DHEA, and pregnenolone is a little pricier, so maybe they spend 20 bucks a month on that. Whereas if you go through the compounding pharmacy, it's like 40, this adds a few dollars, that adds a few dollars. So it ends up being better for the patient, it's less pills they have to take, and so I just put it into one, okay? The downside of that is if you want to make a change in DHEA and leave everything else the same, you have to write a new prescription, okay? So sometimes if I'm concerned, what I'll do is I'll start a patient on them separately, oral progesterone, oral DHEA, oral pregnenolone, figure out what dosing works for them, then compound it. And then if we need to start playing with the numbers, we separate it again, figure it out, compound it back in, and go from there. 
Here are ranges for progesterone. That should be 300, but 50 to 300. DHA is going to be 5 to 25, which we'll talk about soon, and then pregnenolone. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, DHEA. I know we already, yes, question. How often are you <coughs> either rerunning the labs or following up as you sort of supplement some of these pregnenolone or testosterone? <coughs> Initially, usually around three months. But again, as I said with the testosterone, if <coughs> we get to the three, close to the three month mark and we're still titrating up the dose per the patient response, I'm not gonna waste money with lab testing. I'll wait. But usually within the first three to six months, I've done one to two blood tests. Once we get patients stable, most of the time it's once a year. And then if things hit the wall for whatever reason, then we look back and say, okay, let's, <clears throat> if, like with my patient, if we had increase, 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 and she still was not getting that reduction in hot flashes, after about six months of trying, I would have been like, okay, let's get labs to really figure out what's going on here. Or I shouldn't say really figure out what's going on, I should say to maybe give us a piece of information we don't have.